instrumental in facilitating Glenhurst's participation. Uh, and we're fortunate, very fortunate, that she wanted to include us in Alex's uh, series. So it's great. Uh, as Sonia mentioned, I'm the curator uh, and head of collections at Glenhurst in Brantford. We are Brantford's uh, public art gallery. Um, we also serve Brant Region and Six Nations of the Grand River, so approximately 155, 160,000 people uh, within those regions. And we view ourselves as small, but we also view ourselves as mighty uh, for a small nonprofit cultural institution. So I encourage you to visit us when um, restrictions lift, whenever that may be. See our exhibitions, visit our tea room. Uh, last time I joked that if you, you mentioned my name, you get a free scone. I don't know if that's true anymore, but um, you can give it a try. Okay. So in the last talk, um, you probably noticed, it. For, for some of you, this may be a bit of a refresher. Uh, so I'm going to begin this evening by introducing uh, myself in the traditional Anishinaabe way, which was given to me by the Ojibwe author and knowledge keeper, Eli Baxter good friend of mine, and Eli was, uh, is a member of Martin Falls First Nation, which is about 400 kilometers northwest of Thunder Bay. Uh, and I'm fortunate enough to be editing Eli's memoir that details his early life, uh, working on the trap line uh, along the Albany River with his mom and his dad. Uh, and he is also a survivor of two residential schools. Fortunately, the pandemic has, has delayed our um, progress in finding a publisher, uh, but we will keep looking. Uh, Eli asked that I repeat the Anishinaabe greeting when introducing myself to audiences uh, and before speaking about Indigenous work. Uh, so here it is. So, Buju, Nindejine Kaas, Matthew, Nudo Temwa, Bejesh, Deshkan, Zibe Nindun, Jepe. So, Buju, math uh, is hello. My name is Matthew, my clan is the Martin. Antler River, I come from. And Antler River is the traditional Anishinaabe name for um, the Thames River. Uh, so I, I essentially come from, from London. The good London, I should say, London, Ontario. So this evening draws on subject matter I presented a few weeks ago at the Alex Art Gallery. I mean, it, it was a few weeks ago, it seems like many, many months ago. Uh, at that time, I surveyed the history of Expo 67 in Montreal, and particularly the formation of the artist collective Professional Native Indian Artists, Inc. So today, I can in no way uh, explain the profound complexity of our topic of contemporary art produced by Indigenous artists in 45, 50 minutes. That's impossible, and, and frankly, it would be extremely unfair. Uh, so instead, I've decided to uh, demonstrate how artists that comprise the PNIAI, uh, which I discussed, set a precedent for Indigenous artists working today, our contemporary Indigenous artists. So as a quick refresher, uh, the PNIAI was made up of um, Daphne Ojig, uh, Norval Morriso, one of my favorites, Carl Ray. Eddie Kobinus, Jackson Beardy, Alex Janvier, and Joseph Sanchez. Tonight, uh, I, I've selected four, I was going to select five, but I didn't have time, uh, four remarkable artists uh, whose work differs in, in many different ways, um, but also they hold some similarities as well. Um, like the members of the PNIAI, uh, they too draw on cultural traditions to explore the politics uh, and aesthetics of today's contemporary world. So I'll ask that as I go through, um, you just think about the connections and relationships between them throughout my talk. Um, so we also have several new viewers who are unable to, to view the, the previous talk. Um, like I mentioned, many from uh, Glenhurst community. So you may recognize some overlap at first, um, but I assure you that the remainder will be uh, new material. And again, it's by no means comprehensive, but hopefully raises some interesting and important topics of discussion and it can expand our knowledge and understanding of what I believe 
uh, and what uh, many of us believe in this video conference thingy uh, to be some of the best contemporary practices going. I also need to mention that I have a cat. She's currently asleep right now, uh, staring. Well, she sometimes opens her one eye to stare at me. Um, so she may jump up at me. You may hear her crying for food at, at some point. So um, don't be concerned. There we go. Okay, so this group of artists, the PNIAI, made much of what we see today possible, and their name is antiquated by today's standards, uh, but this is the name that they chose. So uh, I repeat it here. 1974, Beardy, Ojig, Janvier uh, were joined by Kobe Nesmore, so Ray and Sanchez at an informal meeting uh, at Ojig's home in Winnipeg to discuss these uh, ideas and strategies and directions for the creation of an artist collective. And following this meeting, uh, the newly formed collective wanted to make their relationship official uh, and they wanted to make it legal. So they incorporated their name. Uh, the group first uh, exhibited together at Dominion Gallery in Montreal in 1975, and this was somewhat to, to critical acclaim. And I have a review. I don't know how I found it. It took a little searching. But this is actually a review. Um, one of the few that you could find uh, from the Montreal Magazine Artist Secrets from 1975. And it's, uh, it's a pretty incredible document. So if you, if you brush up on your French, uh, it'll be somewhat clear. So the PNIAI is one of the most important artist collectives in Canada, arguably as important as uh, the beloved group of seven. In effect, they fought against the idea that all indigenous painting, sculpture, uh, drawing was handicraft, that it was craft, and thus it existed outside of the realm of fine art, uh, outside of the realm even of contemporary art. Uh, they sought to be taken seriously as professional visual artists, as was their, their right to do so. They just, they wanted to be taken seriously. I think that's the most important point. Um, their, their work was not traditional per se, but it drew on tradition to create something that was radically new and radically innovative and radically experimental and exciting and beautiful. And by doing this, they challenged uh, a prevailing stereotype that uh, indigenous culture was anchored in the past, which it clearly wasn't. So the PNIEI was at first referred to as the Indian Group of Seven, which was a title given to the group by a Winnipeg Free Press reporter. Um, that moniker uh, as the Group of Seven, um, giving it to these artists, in a way lessened their accomplishments. It was a bit of an insult. Um, and it positioned them in a, in a hierarchy, essentially below the, the, the group of seven, uh, Canada's beloved group of seven. Um, so in a way, um, it, was, it was derogatory in a way. And it also, uh, it was not the name they chose for themselves. And I, I think we can all agree on that. Uh, more so, whose work you see here. Uh, recognized for being one of the first contemporary artists of indigenous descent to be authentic to his own culture uh, and his own lived experiences while still being part of the broader uh, contemporary art scene in Canada. It's perhaps, I would say, maybe his most important legacy. Um, he was also the first indigenous artist to be recognized with a retrospective exhibition uh, by the National Gallery of, of Canada in Ottawa. And famously more so created what is commonly referred to as the Woodland School or Woodland Movement, the Woodland Style. Uh, it's also known as legend painting. Uh, sometimes people call it X-ray art, which um, doesn't sound very good. Last time uh, I discussed how it sounds like uh, something you would find in a hospital. Um, I was never fond of that term. But anyway, he invented this style. Uh, in the 1950s, late 1950s and 1960s in Northern Ontario, uh, 
the style was revolutionary because it fused different elements. One of them was it fused European uh, easel painting. It also fused uh, Ojibwe birch bark scrolls, and it also fused pictographic paintings uh, together. So a, a pictograph, I should mention, is a picture uh, or a symbol that's, that's painted or, or etched uh, into rock. I'll show this beautiful work too. So Morisot's uh, work was at first uh, heavily criticized by members of his community for painting um, traditional spiritual knowledge, for painting sacred legends, sacred stories, uh, which had belonged before that to the realm of Ojibwe oral tradition uh, for thousands of years. And the debate over uh, the use of traditional stories, materials, uh, or even spiritual beliefs still exists to this day. And uh, you'll see some of the examples of this later on. Uh, with its bright colors, as you see here, this is a tremendous piece. Um, I believe it's the arc, it's loaned out to the AGO. Yeah. So it's bright colors, bold lines, uh, two dimensional design. Uh, woodland art really is one of the most recognizable and even one of the most imitated uh, art styles in Canada. And it's always important to mention too that um, we should never be deceived by the um, minimalism of these paintings uh, because the colors, the subject matter, the themes that are explored in that woodland school, the woodland style carries powerful symbolic uh, messages and spiritual messages as well. And so I'm speaking about painting, which is why my first uh, example, um, first person I'll discuss uh, is Lawrence Paul. So that's a good segue, I thought, uh, in, to introduce his work. So in 2016, the Mu Museum of uh, Anthropology at the University of British Columbia hosted a major exhibition of his career, uh, and it actually spanned more than 30 years. His name, Yukolupton, uh, is Salish for the man of many masks. Also in 2016, you may have, if you're not familiar with him or his work, uh, he led a widely publicized uh, campaign to legally change the name of British Columbia, uh, this colonial name, uh, and den denounce its colonial history, essentially, under the hashtag rename BC. Last year, uh, I, I was commissioned to interview uh, Lawrence Paul uh, for First American Art, and um, I think Amer America is in this this chat, so thank you, America, uh, for, for giving me the opportunity to do so. Uh, and Lawrence, Paul and I spoke on the phone uh, and over email and over text uh, quite a few times, and, and you can find it um, on back issue. Um, and it's, it makes for some good reading, let me tell you. Uh, he's an extraordinary painter, absolutely extraordinary painter. Uh, he is known for these beautiful, as you see here, these beautiful, colorful paintings, uh, and also for his uncompromising uh, subject matter, I would say, uh, that directly challenges um, the burdens of colonialism in, in Canada, in North America, and, and, and elsewhere. So this painting is titled, uh, Killer Whale Has a Vision and Comes to Talk to Me About Proximological Encroachments of Civilizations in the Oceans. So in it, we see a great example of how he fuses uh, traditional Coast Salish uh, cosmology uh, and spiritual beliefs, Northwest Coast design, and you can see it uh, more on the, on the right-hand side in the mountains with those ovoids, um, which is, which is really, uh, and they're super colorful too, um, which has always blown me away. And it's also fusing uh, the tradition of, of Western landscape painting, which, which I, I think most of us would be familiar with. I did not know what proxim proximology was. So uh, I looked it up. And proximology is the study of chronic conditions such as pollution or waste. 
study of chronic conditions such as pollution or waste. So um, you can see the orca on the left coming out of, of the water, which is not clear. Uh, it's dripping with um, an oily substance um, and, and it's dirty water essentially. So uh, this, this painting essentially is about the poisoning of, of the oceans. And it, what it's, it's fascinating that it does so under this, this beautiful color scheme and, and pattern, um, which I always loved about his, his work. So here's another one. He pulls no punches, like I said. Um, he has, has said that outspo his outspoken beliefs on colonialism uh, have actually prevented him from having more exhibitions and, and perhaps even more um, critical recognition from, from the institutional art world and such. Um, and I was curious to know how he navigates uh, or, or reconciles the fact that he creates these huge, um, yeah, these, the scale doesn't do it justice here, um, these huge, beautiful paintings and also these blunt uh, political statements um, like this one that I'll show you. And the title could not be more to the point. This is a work from 2013. So I posted uh, his response to my question here. <clears throat> so he says, a lot of artists like to create work that has no reference to the hard realities of this country. Somebody has to look at this stuff. Somebody has to look at the tar sands and global warming. Prime Minister Trudeau is trying to push his carbon tax and you have all these provinces trying to stop him. That is what people have to deal with. We're one of the biggest problems of global warming and we still have people that are fighting it because they want to get wealthy and stay home or stay, home, stay wealthy and ignore all the business that has to be done to rectify our global carbon. So that's from that, that interview that, that Lawrence and I did. And I'll, I'll give you a few seconds to, to look carefully at the painting. I'm hoping you could see some details on your screen here. Um, because Lawrence Paul literally paints the BP, uh, BP and Shell. Uh, I can't see, I had trouble seeing the, the middle company, but uh, Shell's on the left and BP's on the right. So he's literally painting these executives um, as criminals pour, uh, pouring oil into ocean water that's behind them. As I mentioned earlier, um, I was thinking of interesting ways to, to connect the works uh, and artists together. And I, I just wanted to show kind of a, an array of, of fascinating and kind of politically charged and biting work. Um, and I had, I had been interested uh, in this piece and I have never had the chance to, to speak about it. So I thought, why not? Um, Sonia invited me to, so, uh, it gave me a good chance to, to do some research on it and talk about it. So in 1997, uh, Lawrence Paul decorated a rifle. Uh, you can somewhat see it here uh, and traveled to the UK for a performance that saw him literally uh, shoot Canada's Indian Act legislation with a rifle. Um, and the work resists the legislation uh, mandated by the Indian Act, which I'll touch on in a minute. I'll give some historical context, but it's a performative work that was documented in the UK because the Indian Act stems from, as he says, uh, British legislation stemming from uh, the Royal Proclamation, the British North American Act, the Canadian Constitution, and the New Constitutional Act. So uh, copies of the shot up document were sent to Queen Elizabeth II the Prime Minister of Canada uh, and members of Canadian Parliament. And, and some of the, the members actually wrote him back and, and basically said, according to Lawrence Paul, that things were gonna get better. Uh, in his words, quote, shooting the Indian Act was funny, it was nasty, and it was serious, end quote. So the 1800s uh, saw policies of assimilation enforced by the Canadian government. And these instruments of assimilation were mandated through the act, which was essentially a set of laws that applied only to indigenous people of Canada. 
uh, the act enforced mandatory residential school attendance, cultural bans such as bans against potlatches, bans against ghost dancing, um, and it restricted resource use. It also authorized the Canadian government to regulate the day-to-day -day lives of registered Indigenous people. It enabled the government to determine the land base of groups uh, through the reserve system uh, and essentially by segregating Indigenous populations. Uh, and in fact, and it's little known that um, South Africa's uh, apartheid system, um, before South Africa, sorry, before South Africa created their apartheid system, they consulted uh, Canada's treatment towards uh, Indigenous people, which is a horrible part of history, but, uh, and I don't, from what I've come across, I don't think that's very well known. Um, so the act has gone, undergone several amendments since it was first passed in 1876, but today uh, it largely remains um, in its original form. Uh, it's also made Indigenous people in Canada some of the most legislated people within the Western world. So to bring it back, um, and I'll bring it back to Lawrence Paul, he said, quote, I, I shot the Indian Act because it's such a racist ideology of colonialism, end quote. So I was trying to make connections between history, between contemporary art, and it brought me to Nadia. So um, this is a different approach to tackling something as, as vast um, and complex as the Indian Act. Um, and, she, and Nadia created a work of the same name. So she's an Algonquin member of the Kitagon Zibi Anishinaabe First Nation, and an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary artist who won Canada's Sobe Art Award in 2014. And I, I interviewed her in 2013 or so, um, right before she won it, uh, which was wonderful. And we talked specifically about this work, which I will show you. Here we go. So this work <clears throat> is a bead work that covers 56 of the annotated version, 60, 56 pages, sorry, of the annotated version of the act. So here letters are replaced with red and white glass seed beading. Each word is replaced with white uh, beads sewn into the document and the red beads actually replace uh, the negative space. Between 1999 and 2002, Nadia enlisted over 230, uh, 230 friends, colleagues, and strangers to help her bead over the act. And as I said earlier, the original act from 1876 is considered a living document and it undergoes amendments, uh, changes. Um, so she consciously left parts of the work um, in an unfinished state to kind of reflect that it's it, this living, organic, uh, breathing document. Let's go back though, because you can't really see. Okay. The beads here represent or symbolize indigenous culture and indigenous presence even. I think that may be more important, which are then actually embedded into this colonial system, this racist, system of legislation by the government and it essentially destroys the act and nullifies it by covering it up with beadwork so you see here this is an installation view and the collaboration and the final objects are about self-determination they're about self-representation about agency um, and about presence like i said uh, and unlike Lawrence Paul's approach, uh, there were no guns involved. Um, so you can kind of see um, how, how two artists uh, are approaching similar subject matter. And I think that's, that's super interesting to see. Now, uh, so the idea of self-representation, personal agency in mind, I'm gonna look back again to history, um, specifically with Curtis in order to go again to the future uh, to look at Nic Nicholas Galanin. So um, Curtis, born in uh, 1868, he worked for 30 years. He produced four, 
40,000 photographs that ranged from Canada's north to Mexico. Um, the photo series, the North American Indian, was funded by financier and philanthropi philanthropist J.P. Morgan, uh, and this is considered his magnum opus. It captures the cultural practices, languages, um, traditions of more than 80 indigenous tribes in North America. And for taking their picture, he became known as the shadow catcher. It's, it's considered um, one of the largest records of indigenous people ever produced, and it has elicited some praise, but a hell of a lot of scrutiny, and for good reason. Curtis firmly believed that Indigenous people were, in North America were, were, quote, a vanishing race. So to maintain this conviction, he was known to remove uh, parasols and, and clocks and fashion items and, and wagons and other traces of modern life from his photographs. Um, I didn't include one today, but um, there's quite a few that he manipulated his images. So even the authenticity, the truth of these images has been under scrutiny, certainly for the last few decades. Add to this that these sepia-toned images give the air of the air, the texture of the past, uh, of history. They have the look and feel of an antique. And he played, he played right into the Western world's um, romanticization of so-called primitive people, which further exposes the racist beliefs, the racist ideology of the day. Uh, namely that European society was the apex of, of civilization and, and all other, everything else, literally everything else lacked this kind of cultural sophistication. So this is an image here uh, that he took called Evening in Hopi Land. And uh, I want you to notice the hair uh, on the women because it'll, it'll come up later. So Curtis's photographs have always been, or have been accused, sorry, of race, racial essentialism. Uh, for one thing, he didn't label uh, many of his photographs, um, and he didn't, he, so he didn't label the people in them, uh, and he also didn't label the, the land uh, where the photographs took place. Um, so this gave a tendency to, to blur individuals, to blur tribes, uh, and to blur traditional lands uh, down to one type, and that type was, was North American, or Native American as well. Um, and so, I mean, that would be like um, narrowing down all people in the UK to, to just the English. And uh, I know for a fact that, that many Welsh and Scottish and Irish folks would not want to be called English. Um, so, uh, ultimately, Curtis was charged and is charged with reinforcing uh, the racist concept of the noble savage uh, while manipulating images so that they fit this ideological narrative that he was pursuing, F seeing indigenous people as untouched or pure of the influence of the, the modern outside world, which was just not true. And it also had nothing to do with the, the very real struggles uh, and forced adaptation to European colonial society. So we go from there to Galanin. So uh, Galanin is a Klingit artist from Sitka, Alaska. Um, his work's really cool. He's been interested uh, in Edward Curtis actually for quite a while. So, so there's another connection that I was trying to facilitate. Um, I'm going to read you a snippet from an interview with him. Uh, and this is what he said when he was asked about his research on Curtis. Quote, his work was stereotyping and romanticizing indigenous people, building this idea of a culture that's vanishing, which it isn't. I'm still here. I'm still doing work. He perpetuated these false ideas of purity and mystery, end quote. So with that in mind, I'll show you this. Um, this is a photographic work by Glennon. <clears throat> and it, it shows the implied influence of a Curtis portrait of a Hopi woman on the design of the Star Wars character, Princess Leia, who was played by the late Carrie Fisher. So for Galan, and this is considered cultural appropriation. But he says in that same interview that cultural appropriation can be positive. It can be positive, but it can only when protocols of consent um, or a return of favor 
are followed. So I wanted to share this as well, which is one of my favorite videos from him, because uh, I don't think it gets enough attention. This is Suhedi Shugak Tutan. Uh, that translates to, we will again open this container of wisdom that has been left in our care. And I'll show you, uh, we don't have time for the, for the full video, but it's on YouTube. Um, and it's a two-part video. The first video on the left uh, sees hip-hop dancer David Elsewhere. He's popping and locking uh, in inside the studio to the beat of a tribal drum. So I'm going to show you a little clip from that. Um, bear with me, because I could really screw this part up. So I'm going to stop share. Am I okay, Sonia? Is this? <laughs> yeah, okay, hold on. Uh, and then I'll bring this up. It's looking good. Okay, and then I will share this, and then I will big screen that. That's it, we can see it. And then I will play this, okay. You may have to turn your um, volume up as well. And I'm going to share the second video. Uh oh, hold on. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't want that. I want this. Okay, can you see that? Okay. Nothing's coming up just yet. Okay. I'm going to get this, I swear. Here we go. There it is. Yep, okay. we see it. <clears throat> okay. This is the second video. I'm going to talk over it um, as you watch. So uh, this is the second video in, in that two-part series. Um, so this is Dan Littlefield uh, wearing traditional dress, and he's rising from his knees to perform a ritual dance that's set against this sweet uh, electronic rhythm um, before a massive clinglet screen. Um, and there's a tension here. So the tension between traditional and the present day as exemplified in, in the clothing, in the song, in the dance. Um, and this is why the work was initially criticized uh, by elders for being disrespectful to um, cultural tradition. And the elders believe that the, this collision uh, of tradition with present day hip hop, uh, electronic culture, um, could do harm to Klingit culture. Uh, and there's actually, on that particular point, there's some literature on that um, idea so for example, uh, curator Bruce Bernstein argues that the debate over inappropriate subject matter in contemporary art is often used to reinforce the status quo rather than break from it. So in other words, according to Bernstein, uh, the status quo prevents the organic transformation and evolution uh, of cultural norms and cultural values and cultural expressions like this. Um, so with that in mind, uh, we could consider a work like this possibly uh, about being about change or transformation itself. Now, wish me luck as I shift back. Seamless. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. So this is the last artist uh, I'm going to discuss. I think I'm 
we'll go to eight. So I have, I have 12 minutes, right? So um, this is my friend, Scott Winati. Um, and it makes sense to talk about uh, her work in the context of, of change and transformation. Scott Winati is a Haudenosaunee artist from Montreal who examines indigenous cultural history through avatars and virtual gaming environments like Second Life, who some of us have, may have played years ago or are involved with now. Um, the majority of her work treats cyberspace as a metaphor for the future, as a metaphor for the future. And she garnered uh, initial, a lot of initial attention through this cyber project called Time Traveler, uh, which is this episodal video series that you see here. So the videos, uh, sorry, that you see on the right-hand side, on the left is a photograph. Um, the videos are created in that online game environment, virtual environment, Second Life. And Second Life uh, is where you, it has a graphics engine uh, that has like this toolbox in it that's built into it. So like a TV director or a film director, you can manipulate the cameras that are in that Second Life program um, to capture video itself. So you can create, you essentially create an avatar in Second Life, and then the tools in Second Life allow you to film your avatar walking through or experiencing whatever environment that you also create. So it's really this interesting thing. You may know that uh, uh, this as machinima, um, which is what more like what it's, it's commonly referred to. So here on the right hand side, um, I'm not going to show you this video because we don't have time, but, but you can certainly Google time traveler and all the episodes are up, uh, off of Skawanati's website. So he's a Mohawk man, uh, Hunter, you see, uh, he's a man, Hunter's from the 23rd century, uh, and he has a vision quest and he encounters the truths of indigenous historical events, so such as the Dakota Sioux uprising, um, the occupation of Alcatraz, or the Oka crisis, which is what you see here. So in this episode, Skawanati retells the Oka crisis from the Mohawk point of view, which was underrepresented by the Canadian media. Um, so Skawanati made her own. Um, and it's super interesting. I think it's about 20 minutes. So if you're interested in that, you should definitely check it out. If you're not familiar with the Oka crisis, it was a land dispute uh, between uh, land developers and uh, the Mohawk um, because the developers wanted to build a golf course and condos um, on disputed land that actually included uh, a burial ground as well. I was fortunate enough to curate Skawanati's exhibition from Sky World to Cyberspace when I was the curator in residence at Macintosh Gallery um, at Western University a few years ago. Um, you may have to wear sunglasses because th those pink walls are pretty bright. Um, the show first opened in March of 2019 and then later it traveled um, to the University of Waterloo Art Gallery, um, which is just down the road from London. As you can see, uh, I pushed for the walls to be painted bright pink. I think the exact color was called crushed berries and it looks so good. Um, but more importantly, it actually matched um, the exact color that, that are in some of the works themselves. And a significant part of the show focused on Scavenati's personal avatar, XOX, which is what you see here. So this is a diptych, uh, two works called Dancing With Myself from 2015. And it's a photograph of Skawanati on the right and an image of XOX, her avatar that she created in Second Life on the left. So not only is her avatar's outfit reproduced for Skawanati's body, but a fashion photographer, um, a makeup artist, a hairstylist were also hired for the photo shoot to try and get Skawanati to look exactly like the avatar. And this special pose was even created for um, the avatar because Skawanati apparently had this um, strange stance that was very difficult to replicate in Second Life. So at first, the differences here between the artist and XOX are kind of tricky to distinguish. In her words, I'm gonna read you something. Quote, 
what I hope to show is not that I want to be like my avatar or my avatar wants to be like me, but that we want to be like each other, end quote. So it's kind of neat because there's this symbiosis between the artist and her avatar. And she relates that to how one's identity can splinter or, or fragment uh, across the internet and across social media. So how an individual bec can become someone else or something else entirely in cyberspace. This is a related work. Um, and I'll give you some secret here. That was just a plinth because uh, we didn't have a floating shelf. So Brian, the install technician from Macintosh, literally screwed it into a, a wall and um, it worked. So that's some of the behind the scenes um, stuff that actually happens. So this is Generations of Play 3D. So these are three figurines. So on the left, you see a Cornhusk doll. In the middle, a Barbie doll. And on the right is actually a 3D print of XOX. And it shows essentially these systems of play throughout time. And she wanted this work to bridge feminine imagery from the past, uh, so on the left, to the present, and then into the future on the right. Um, and Jolene Ricard wrote about this specific work and what she said is, is, is wonderful. So I'm gonna read you that here. She says, the urgency of seeing indigenous people as both traditional and contemporary. So this work highlights that idea. And it's something that the PNII artists shared as well as those artists that I mentioned tonight, that urgency of seeing uh, indigenous people both as traditional and contemporary. This is the last work I'll show. I think I'm on time. Yep. So this is just an image um, from the machinima and I'm going to show you a snippet of that. <clears throat> so in this video work, which is quite new, uh, called She Falls for Ages, Skawanati actually retells the Haudenosaunee uh, creation story through avatars in cyberspace. And here you see the protagonist, Ositsugayan, um, and Ositsugayan is Mohawk for Ancient Flower. Uh, she forecasts the death of her cosmic home, Skyworld, and then she volunteers to become the seed of the new world during a renewal ceremony. Shortly after the tree that you see here, the celestial tree um, actually rises from the ground and a small hole is revealed that um, shows the entire universe. And Osutsugayan bids farewell to her loved ones before she steps into the hole and quite literally falls for ages. So this is a retelling of the Haudenosaunee creation story from a different perspective. And there are actually multiple, um, like, like with all creation stories, there is some variation between them. Um, but I'm gonna show you the clip uh, that picks it up here. So right when she's about to step into the void. Wish me luck again. As I navigate this, okay. Oh, I completely screwed up. Hold on a second. Let me go back to that. Oh, uh, okay. I got it now. And he's got it. Okay. We'll watch a short clip of this. So again, Osetsugayan is about to step into the void that the celestial tree has left. Um, and it picks up on the creation story. She falls for so long that she has time to scream, to cry, to pray, to lose, and regain her sanity. Finally, to sleep. A flock of geese are soaring through the beautiful blue sky when they notice a strange creature does not appear to be flying. As they get near, 
they see that it has neither wings nor fins and that it is sleeping. They worry that this being will be hurt if it hits the water. Indeed, there is not yet any land on earth. Those helpful, kindly geese intercept Ojita Gaim's fall. She is very grateful. She understands the geese's thoughts. They are trying to figure out what to do with her. They decide to ask the turtle if she can rest on his back. There is some land. But of course it was not land. At least, not the way you think of it. So I'm just going to mute that because we're coming up on eight o'clock. Um, I'll just let it run in the background. So, uh, Asitagayan's fall is eventually broken by a goose and she forms a new world out of sacred seeds that she has uh, on the back of this green turtle. Um, and Turtle Island uh, is the original indigenous name for, for North America. So um, the whole work essentially here is the result of Osizagayan's interstellar voyage. Um, and Skawanati's work I always thought was super interesting because it jumps kind of seamlessly between the past and then the present and then the future, back to the past, to the future, back. and um, and it's something that I think conceptually I try to do tonight by by looking to to history and trying to give a context to to some of the work that I showed um, with you and shared with you this evening. So um, that that idea that Scalinati's futuristic uh, world that you see here um, it's about self determination and it's about sovereignty uh, and it's about about self representation and as well. Um, so I think I, I am definitely running out of time. So I'll wrap this up and just say that we see artists using um, cultural traditions in, in new ways, uh, transforming the past, uh, transforming traditional stories and, and histories uh, and materials into something new and something exciting and, and innovative and experimental and beautiful. Um, so I hope that's come across in some of the words I've shared with you tonight. And finally, I do have to say this, that I very much encourage you to continue supporting arts and culture, uh, galleries and museums, big and small, um, right now online, like we're doing here, and certainly after restrictions lift, um, because we all very much need your support. So uh, I'm going to thank you very much, and thank you everybody for um, being here and for the talk. Uh, and I guess I will give it to, give it over to Sonia. Wow, thank you. That was, that was great. Oh, yeah, I'm going to clap because everybody else is clapping. <laughs> wow, thank you for, yeah, sharing those reflections. I appreciate it. Um, and I'm so glad everybody that was here got to enjoy that just now. So uh, what an enjoyable hour together. <laughs> um, I just want to encourage all of you as well to please visit our, um, our websites. If you're interested in the Judith and Norman Alex Art Gallery, you can find us at jnag.ca, j-n-a-a-g.ca. I would encourage you to please sign up for our newsletter. That's the best way for you to find out what we're up to, how we're interacting with the community, where you can reach us. If you're on social media platforms, please look us up. Um, I also encourage you to please go to the Glenhurst Art Gallery website. They're at glenhurst.ca. Uh, you can register for their digital newsletter as well, right on their homepage. Um, and we hope to continue to engage with you guys and provide you with um, experiences. Uh, until then, please stay well and thanks for sharing this space. Um, good night. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate it. Bye bye. Bye.